So we're here um, at the Texas uh, Medical Center Complex. This is our last day in Houston. I'm heading home soon. Uh, I wore this yesterday. I meant to have it on today for our visit to Rice University for the Biotech Center. But um, someone from Texas actually made me this beautiful shirt, Nature Not Nano. So I wanted to make sure to feature that here as we talk about the Biotech uh, Nanotech program. So just for context, this is about a two square mile area, um, sort of outside of downtown Houston, near the Museum District and Rice University. Uh, it has 60 different medical institutions. Um, it employs 106,000 people. And so I think we can imagine the economic imperative of chronic illness management um, in the space. And it's very important to understand um, you know, as we're understanding germ theory and terrain theory, that the Gulfport area around Houston is the country's largest refinery district. And that has profound implications for overall health term in terms of uh, breathing, cancer, many, many things. And so the focus on nanotechnology, specifically around COVID, needs to be understood within this context, that many people have been harmed based on the foundational economic system of Houston as a petrochemical center, refining center. Um, and thus far, up until now, like the nanotech, internet of bio nano things has not been a part of that conversation. But now uh, with the nano level sensor technologies, um, that is coming into play under COVID. So this, the area behind me, this bioscience research collaborative, uh, this is affiliated with Rice University, but it's, it takes up the whole building and it is a collaborative space um, that brings in researchers from many of these different medical schools and other research institutions, although it's hosted by Rice University. Rice University is based here in Houston. It was uh, founded by William Rice, who uh, was actually from the North was from Massachusetts, and he made a fortune in uh, real estate, railroads, and cotton in the late 19th century. So sort of the Reconstruction era carpetbagger. When he died, his plan was to leave the bulk of his estate to establish Rice University. And it turns out he was in his 80s in 1900, and he was actually murdered by his valet in his sleep with chloroform and they had changed his will to have it redirected to some other beneficiary. So it was litigated, but essentially the origins of Rice University are, are in murder, which is kind of interesting because it is a small um, a college here in Houston, but it has a lot access to a lot of resources. It doesn't offer PhD programs. It has a few graduate programs, but it's, it's been a center of material science research for quite some time. Um, it has close ties to NASA, and it also, um, in the 90s, created something called the Baker Institute, which is a think tank around public policy in many different forms. And they host different fellows. And a recent fellow included John Rogers. Uh, he was a senior fellow at this Baker Institute based at Rice. Um, and he was the chair of the Goldman Sachs Foundation. And as we know, Goldman Sachs is central to all of the human capital bonds. So we need to understand what is unfolding now is supply chain management of human capital through these sensor-based technologies. And in that, Rice University covers both bases. So, you know, this Texas Medical Center um, predates well this bioscience research collaborative. This collaborative was started in 2010. So a little over 10 years ago, this was created. Um, the overall uh, complex itself dates to the 1940s. The anchor tenant was the MD Anderson Cancer Center. So again, we see the rise of chronic illness and cancers in tandem with um, the economic basis of Houston as a petrochemical refining site. Um, this bioscience research center is modeled on existing collaboratives, including BioX, which is based out of Stanford, and the Broad Institute out of MIT. So it is in that league. This bioscience research collaborative, collaborative being the operative word here, they share research space with, among other organizations, the NASA Space Biomedical Program, uh, the Electronic Health Research Program, uh, the Medical Futures Lab, and the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics. 
So that is the t sort of work that is being done. And if we understand it within the context of um, this Moonshot project, like the Japan Science and Technology Agency, um, the, that, that we will, by 2050, live outside the limits of a physical body and mind and time and space, that we will live as an avatar. Um, looking at the work of uh, Ian Akildas at Georgia Tech, uh, the internet of bio nano things, that we will become uh, seamless, ubiquitous computing systems within this larger planetary computer sensor-based technology. But most of the sensors are going to be at this nano scale. So they will be invisible to the human eye. We will be put into this sensor-based gaming environment. And we might not even be able to see the apparatus of the game itself. So I want to touch on my first exposure to rice and this biomedical research was early on in the pandemic when I realized that they were playing a central role in the development of the quantum dots uh, for uh, fluorescent subdermal documentation of vaccine status. So that had come sort of initially out of MIT and then landed here at Rice. But this idea of quantum dots really being used for supply chain tracking in many things from food systems to medical cannabis to now um, vaccine status. And so that came out of research that was done here at Rice. Um, also related to COVID, uh, this past February, they got a million dollars from DARPA to develop nanotech sensors to defect, detect COVID in the air, okay? So again, we're living in you know Cancer Alley and um, with all sort of environmental pollutants from the chemical industries. And yet now uh, with this uh, virus that has such a high survival rate, they're gonna come up with a specialized nano sensor to track it. Um, uh, Kevin McHugh is, is a, a researcher here. Okay, so Kevin McHugh was working on the quantum dots. Um, there's a, a professor, Jacob Robinson. He was given a lot of DARPA money as well, uh, $8 million for something called the MOANA project. It is magnetic, MOANA stands for Magnetic Optical Acoustic Neural Access, and it is using light to decode messaging, and he is working on wireless communication between brains. So some of these things I come to talk about, it's hard to imagine that this is real, but again, our federal money is going into um, this type of research, br wireless brain-to-brain -brain communication. In this project, there are 16 research groups across four states. It's being coordinated out of Rice. Other uh, it, it, others involved include Baylor, Texas Children's Hospital, Duke, Columbia, MIT, and Yale. So these are very heavy, heavy hitters. Um, also, there is a gentleman, uh, Rice is part of the DARPA Next Generation Non-Surgical Neurotech Program. And this is an idea of augmented cognition through wearable technologies for a future of warfare uh, that, that involves unmanned aerial, aerial war, uh, uh, drones, unmanned autonomous vehicles, uh, AI, and cyber warfare. And so this project, other than Rice, <laughs> um, includes Battelle, Carnegie Mellon, Johns Hopkins, Teledyne, and Park, which is the Palo Alto Research Center. So the, the DARPA Next Generation N3 program of augmented cognition. Now we have to remember the work that James Giordano, the bioethicist based at Georgetown, what he said is this, this is all dual use technology. It is all dual use technology. So while they may say that you're, they're using it just for soldiers, or they're maybe going to use it to, to address Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or other, or psychiatric illness, that it's all the idea of engineering behavior through programming neurons, especially through nanoparticles that cross the blood-brain barrier, is central and really impacts all of us. Um, based, also based here at Rice, um, there's DARPA funding for something called N-TRAIN, N-T-R-A-I-N, which is a wireless implant to control sleep and circadian rhythms. Um, it's engineering at the cellular level. Uh, there's a professor here at Rice, uh, Jacob Robinson, who is working on synthetic neurobiology, and his focus is on actually hydra, which are these tiny, tiny creatures without a head, but with many tentacles, and they have neurons. And so they're using the research around the hydra um, to figure out how to actually code neuronal access and neural prosthetics. Um, Rice is working on intelligent systems to train AI to code, um, and there's a gentleman um, on, I think, floors seven through nine of this building. Uh, $42 million was just put in in 2019 uh, to do this uh, neuro uh, 
neuroengineering lab. So working on engineering neurons. It is connected to a gentleman, his name is Jerzy Zablowski. He, was, he came out of Caltech and um, he was working, his lab is called the Non-Invasive Neuroengineering Lab. And the idea would be to control living tissue and the neuronal functions through ultrasound and then also lights. Um, one of the articles on his lab page is called Control of Brain Circuits with Acoustically Targeted Chemogenetics. And in, in that involved um, managing uh, cellular programs around reward mechanisms and motor control. So these things are all going on. You know, as I say, we're, I'm here, you know, we're, we're living sort of, you know, going on close to 30 years into this world of, of bio nanotechnology. We need to understand it as an economic construct, as a social control construct, and as a spiritual construct, because I think many of us here are standing for natural systems over this idea of molecular engineering of matter and then reducing all of life on this planet to simply molecular assemblages. So this is a really important thing. Um, I haven't had my dandelions the last couple days because I only was able to bring a gallon, but I saved the last bit of dandelions for these two places at Rice because I think it's so important. And my question is, how is this small um, uh, college uh, funneling so many tens of millions of dollars in DARPA money? And I think it has a lot to do with um, the future of the carbon economy shifting to a hydrogen economy, the role of both big finance and big oil in that transition and then the placement of uh, the biomedical, pharmaceutical, academic institutions in moving us towards human plus transhumanism and um, turning our bodies into computational devices. So um, a lot of this I think is frequency. So I have my sing. Um, and just to, to, to re-emphasize our, our statement, children's growth is guided by love, thirst for power and control have no jurisdiction here because this is really, we are here today to protect the children. They are the primary targets and that we, come, we are coming at this from a place of love because love has a frequency. If they're trying to engineer our neurons with artificial acoustics, artificial photonics, light, uh, through these smart um, city technologies, we can say no to that. And I do believe that um, through a position of of faith and love and belief in that life stands with life, nature stands with nature, that it, this will not all come to pass, but some of us who know have to stand in testament to what's going on. So um, sing your song. <laughs> Sorry, my little ladies are flopping over. Um, I have some beautiful acorns that I got along the Colorado River in Austin. These beautiful caps, this is, this is this is God's work. This isn't the work of a molecular assemblage. And so I'm leaving gifts that have been given to me and collected um, cedar, feathers, um, wood and sacred tobacco and some cedar buds and rose petals that were um, taken to the tombstones of uh, Marian Anderson and uh, Rosetta Tharp, amazing musicians who used their vibration, their acoustic to bring um, transcendence to our human world. And so, you know, all we can do is plant seeds. We can't make people understand this as part as we try, but we can plant the seeds and then hopefully someday when people ask how this happened, that this documentation that we've done um, over this past week in Austin and Dallas and in Houston will, will speak to, to this message of standing with natural life. So I'm going to leave this offering here. And I'm gonna crumble my dandelions up by the sign sign I have from my lovely friend in New York, a nature not nano patch that I'm gonna leave, and zealous dandelions. The revolution will not be tokenized, dandelion manifest, keepers of natural life. And I'm gonna leave that um, with the acorn below the sign.